Uh, this is Kevin from Anglican TV. I'm with uh, Charles Raven. And uh, you've become kind of notorious in the last uh, few months as you just published a book. Uh, the book is called Shadow, uh, Shadow Gospel. And uh, do you have a copy with you? You can show uh, the, the people on Anglican TV. And, uh, yes, here it is. Um, what's the, the major topic here of this book you've written? Um, this book is an analysis of Rowan Williams' theology. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very timely because it's clear that the Anglican Communion is in serious difficulties. So this is an attempt to get below the surface of the way that he works theologically. The hermeneutics sort, sort of of Rowan Williams. Yes, that's okay. right. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, part of what I've you know, gathered from listening to you and reading some of the blurbs about the book is uh, Rowan um, uh, achieves his fondness of God through the darkness of what he doesn't know of God. Is mm. that what I'm, to, that, I'm that, getting that's, right? Yes, that's part of the picture. Uh -huh. um, and it, uh, we've, we've always accepted, and it's important that we do, that um, God is transcendent, that um, we don't capture God in the words that we use, um, but the words that we use are very important um, if we are to know him. And uh, I'm arguing that the one of the problems with Rowan Williams' theology is that this sense of God as somehow being in darkness is, uh, uh, is emphasised so much that it leaves us really very uncertain that we can say very much at all about God without confidence, with, with confidence. In fact, in um, one of his books, he says that the best theology is like walking into things in the dark. And what he means by that, I take it, is that when we talk about God, we're not just talking about something in our imagination, that God is real, but it's very difficult for us to say anything uh, very much about him with real confidence or conviction. It's very uh, tentative and that we make gradual progress towards truth about God through conversation and dialogue. Well, and those are all what we might call uh, truths in their way, but um, my book um, exposes the way that these things have lost contact with a, a confident sense that God speaks to us through the Bible. Well, it doesn't seem like any quote I would have read from the New Testament. Uh, <laughs> Paul, the, the Apostle mm. Paul or Christ himself would not have said, uh, stumbling about it in the dark is you know, our best yes. resource for yes. a relationship with the Father. Yes. Um, at what point did you decide that you, know, you need to investigate this further? Uh, did you wake up one day and said, oh my gosh, he's a druid, it's time to, 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 to investigate? <laughs> no, I think the druid thing was a bit of a distraction, actually. Um, I, it was a gradual process. Um, I think I first began to have some concerns uh, about Rowan Williams um, in 2002, when he, he, it was clear that he was in the frame for Archbishop of Canterbury, and he had a track record of strong support um, for those within the Church of England who were working for the acceptance of same-sex relationships and for um, uh, people in same-sex relationships to be able to have some kind of uh, marriage-type service yeah. and blessing um, and for their um, ordination. Mm -hmm. And he'd been very outspoken about that. So it was quite surprising that he then became Archbishop of Canterbury. And a theologian at Oak Hill, uh, Gary Williams, uh, Oak Hill College in London um, had uh, written an article about Rowan Williams during the time that his appointment was being considered and actually came to the conclusion that the theology of Rowan Williams uh, injures souls. That was the phrase that he used. Um, then he did, uh, notwithstanding that, despite that, he became Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, but the next sort of twist in the story was 2003 with the consecration of Gene Robinson in the United States um, and with the attempt to have Geoffrey John um, who uh, was, whether or not he was a celibate homosexual, um, was certainly strongly pushing the same line as Rowan Williams uh, and the protests around the attempt to appoint him as Bishop of Reading. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really what began the tensions within the Anglican sure. Communion. And so um, you started to do a systematic uh, review of Ron Williams. Um, what are, give you two or three examples of his writing that really uh, appear to you to show his hermeneutics for all the, 
uh, intents and better purposes of a, a word I can't find. <laughs> yeah, well, um, if, if, if people want to look at the references for these, they'll need to read the book, so you mm. just have to trust me that I'm not making it up. But um, he, he, uh, um, in, in one essay about um, differences within a theological college on doctrine, um, he says that if we look to Christ for answers, all we will have is what he calls his annihilating judgment. Um, I've already referred to his statement about theology, be, the best theology be, being like stumbling over things in the dark. Um, one of his most, um, I think, uh, arresting statements um, is when he questions our ability to hear God speaking to us and so refers to God as being like a spastic child. Mm -hmm. um, and that may refer as much to our difficulty in understanding God as God's, the clarity of what God says, um, but just the fact that he will use uh, um, a, a, a phrase like that shows, I think, the tendency of his theology, the cast of his mind. Um, and he very rarely makes any sort of systematic reference to scripture. It, his theology is not a biblical or scriptural theology. Which is strange because the pattern of Archbishop of Canterbury's evangelical theologian, evangelical theologian, um, contrasting over you know, a long period of time now. Um, you're saying the basics of this theologian is uh, a lack of scripture. Yes, yeah. Um, well, he, he has uh, an understanding of scripture and he knows scripture well. And I have heard him give, for instance, a talk on John's gospel, mm -hmm. um, which was, uh, really very good um, and was what scholars would call conservative in the sense that he was saying yes I do actually believe John wrote this mm -hmm. um, and that it is accurate. Um, so he's not uh, an out and out liberal from that point of view um, but it, it, the problem is that the voice of scripture is muted that's why I've called the book um, Shadow Gospel because we have something that we can Looks, looks like the Christian gospel, but it doesn't have its substance. And the reason it doesn't, the essential reason it doesn't have that substance um, is because um, Rowan Williams used the Bible uh, uh, as as much a human as a divine book. Um, and so we're forever trying to sort of disentangle um, what could be of God and what isn't of God, which you can't really do. Uh, in any straightforward way. So uh, we just hope that through our continuing uh, fellowship uh, within the institution of the church, um, by being willing to discuss and have conversation, um, that eventually that, um, uh, uh, um, that it's in that process that truth about God will emerge. Well, herein lies the problem we've just discovered in the last half dozen mm. years is talking isn't the answer and listening isn't the answer. Mm. We've become, a, for all better purposes, a, a, a talking and listening, a, a conversational church and not a confirming church. Mm. Um, how is that going to play out uh, as Roland is you know, soon to be ending his term in you know, maybe a half dozen years or so? Uh, is there hope at the end of the tunnel, or is this just what we get in Rowan? I don't think there's any hope at the end of the tunnel if we're putting our hope in Canterbury. Mm -hmm. um, it's clear that it's not that it's not working. Um, even if it, even if we put the theology to one side and looked at this simply as a, an institutional pragmatic strategy strategy to try and keep people around the table, it's not working because um, it, it's clear that the leadership of the Episcopal Church. Uh, in the US is ignoring him. Um, there was a, a so-called marriage of two um, senior women in the Episcopal Church in sure. Boston Cathedral recently, mm -hmm. um, just before the primates meeting, which is coming up next week, for those who are actually going to turn up. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's clear that the leadership of tech are ignoring him, um, and it's a, a growing number of Global South primates 
uh, have realised that uh, there's really just no point in carrying on these conversations which don't go anywhere because there is a basic refusal to exercise any discipline or bring clarity into the situation. And that is consistent with Rowan Williams' theology, but it, it destroys, it actually paradoxically destroys com confidence in the conversations that he wants to be ha have held. I think there's a dual paradox here. One is his understanding of scripture. The other is his understanding of his role as archbishop. Hmm. Uh, he, you know, some believe that the role of archbishop is you have the ability to invite or uninvite people to uh, mm. Anglican events, mm. Uh, mm. such as what's happening with the primates meeting, mm. such as Lambeth and stuff mm. like that, where um, he's under the impression that uh, his role is not thus forth that strong. Mm. And uh, there's this juxtaposition that keeps going on. Yeah, boy, we've learned a lot because of what he writes, but mm. we also learn a lot because of his actions as Archbishop. Yeah. Well, I think he's in a very difficult place, um, and he's put himself there because um, to, uh, to, to be able to carry out the responsibilities of, responsibilities of his office, he had to indulge in a kind of public doublethink. Because um, on the one hand, he says, and he made this undertaking when he became Archbishop of Canterbury, he says that he will uphold the teaching of the communion in terms of Resolution 110 on human sexuality. Well, at least, at least he will, that is what he will articulate and he acknowledges his official teaching. On the other hand, he has not uh, retracted his very strong support for, um, uh, uh, um, for, for same-sex unions and for the ordination of people who are in them, um, which he'd articulated before he became Archbishop. And he's been asked on several times, including um, the South to South encounter in 2005 at the Red Sea, um, he's been asked to repent of those views um, and he has refused. Um, in fact, um, he said that um, in response to the request from the Global South primates in 2005, um, that um, unless their uh, request to him was part of a contribution to the debate, um, it wasn't helpful. He was pretty dismissive. Well, thus his relationship with all the primates. Um, you know, it's very hard in this day and age in a 24-7 information society, I mean, mm. Anglican TV being one of them, um, where everybody has an opinion and they're going to mm. put it on a blog mm. somewhere or a newspaper yeah. or an interview yeah. on Anglican TV yeah. um, to corral all your primates and have of one mind. Yes. Uh, it's yeah. The day and age of one mind yeah. uh, seems uh, long but forgotten. I think w th there are two things which have uh, uh, happened uh, coincidentally here, which I think uh, are part of the reason why things are falling apart institutionally. One, as you say, is the whole kind of communications, internet revolution, which is, I think, is, a, is great because it's democratized information. Mm -hmm. And, and to, so to the extent that information is power, then that's uh, clearly a very good thing. But it's coincided with an archbishop who, for all his tentativeness and openness, is actually uh, exercising a level of personal leadership which I don't ever th think we've ever quite seen before. For instance, at Lambeth 2008, there were no votes. Um, the mind of the meeting was uh, simply summed up by the Archbishop himself. And he has taken it upon himself to um, uh, ignore or sideline decisions which have been made by the primates. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the classic and really destructive example of that was at Dar es Salaam um, in um, 2007, sure. which that led directly to the GAFCON movement. Yeah. Dar es Salaam, for review, the primates put together a, a nice 12-page document mm. that highlighted uh, what has happened and what needs to be done. Mm. You know, and it gave, gave the Episcopal Church a deadline yes. of the 30th of September. Right, which was their House of Bishops meeting in New Orleans. Yeah. And uh, 
he shows up in New Orleans, mm. and the Episcopal Church does not change its mind, does not mm. repent, mm. and all is well. Yeah, it's not. A, it turns out it wasn't an <laughs> ultimatum yeah, no. after all. Um, so we have no longer this. You know, in the last 60, 70 years, there's no longer supremacy of the primates, if there ever was. Mm. There's no longer supremacy of Canterbury. Mm. Um, we have a, a reformation of the standing committee within the uh, AAC or the ACC. Mm. Um, all these things that um, mm. used to work in a colonial type mm. setup mm. is no longer mm. working. No, no. And no. part of that is, I wouldn't say a lack of leadership, but a lack of understanding of the Archbishop to his role as, as Canterbury. Well, I think that there are quite a, a, a um, I think the situation is quite complex and, and it can it includes the the um, the fact that I think the Global South primates are more confident now of their position, they're better informed um, and the uh, doctrinal kind of gaps are becoming greater and greater. They've always been, they've, they've always been there in a sense um, but the significance of the more, much more um, overt the acceptance of overt homosexuality now um, is really what's busted things apart because when it's just in the seminar room you can deal with that mm. um, and uh, even back in the 1920s for instance there was a theologian called Charles Raven um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> who uh, um, uh, uh, um, held views that were de denied the uh, miraculous, the supernatural, trying to give a naturalistic explanation of Christian faith, who was happily tolerated and it didn't cause any problems within the Anglican Communion because frankly most people outside England and even quite a few within didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. Um, but when the, th the thinking actually starts to earth around some quite fundamental changes in Christian moral teaching and what has traditionally been considered to, to be the norms of a, of a society, which is what's happening with the whole sort of sexual revolution of which um, the, the, the gay lesbian movement is at the sharp end, um, then it, 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 people do start to pay attention. Um, but this is not really, as people do often say, about sexuality. That's just been the trigger. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's the really, tip of a big iceberg. That's right. And, and, and it's the, this clarity, centrality, authority of Scripture, mm -hmm. which is the core issue and the one on which Rowan Williams um, is in, cannot deal with. That is a nettle he cannot grasp. So where do people go to get your book? Um, they can get it on um, Amazon.com, okay. Amazon.co.uk, um, or on the uh, Latimer Trust So if they go to Amazon.com, they type in Shadow Gospel, uh, your book will yes, come up. Yes, okay. and, and my name, yeah. yeah that's yeah. awesome. I'll, yeah. I'll also provide a link off the video. Yeah. It's been a pleasure with the interview. Right, this okay, our, our right, thank you. Probably not our last yeah. one. Yeah, okay. All right, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah.